Hello and welcome to the second episode in this low-level JavaScript series on building a virtual machine. You can find a playlist with all the episodes linked on screen now and in the description. In the last episode, we got an idea of what a virtual machine is, and we started with an implementation. The architecture of the VM is a 16-bit register-based machine. Essentially, we have a CPU, which is capable of performing a bunch of different types of tasks, including arithmetic and logical operations and making decisions about where the program should go next. It's register-based because the CPU itself has very small dedicated memory cells on board and they hold values that are being used while the CPU is actually executing its operations. We can move values from main memory into the registers and then from the registers back into main memory and from the registers to the other registers. So far, the machine we're building can only move specific values from memory into the registers and perform additions. That's quite a narrow instruction set to say the least, but it will have to do a lot more than that in order to be in any way remotely useful. This table shows the essential operations. All of these NOP, NOOP instructions, are just mostly placeholders for now. They're spots where more instructions can be added later, which will give the CPU more flexibility and more power. For now, they're very roughly organized by functionality. We have instructions that deal with moving data around, math and logic, jumping to different parts of the program, decision-making, also called branching, stack manipulation, sub-processes, and system functionality. We're not gonna build every instruction here right now, only a couple of them, but first we need to revisit the implementation of the move instructions that we wrote last episode. When building any system, Trade-offs should always be kept in mind, along with the implications that come with any given choice. I chose, rather arbitrarily, a move instruction that encoded the register in the first byte of the instruction implicitly. Like I said last time, that has the benefit of being smaller and requiring less logic to actually execute. But this table of instructions doesn't encode move this way. Let's take a closer look at how it actually does. As you can see, there's quite a few different types of moves that we might want to do. Moving a literal value to a register, moving a register to another register, moving a register value into memory, and so on. So why am I choosing to do things this way now? Well, mostly it's for flexibility going forward. I wanted to illustrate the ways of thinking and the trade-offs you need to keep in mind, but a system that encodes registers into instructions implicitly doesn't easily allow you to change the setup of the registers, how they're arranged, or how many you have. Doing things in this way, this allows us to keep the entire instruction set a little bit smaller and everything is consistent. So let's refactor the current move literal to register implementation, and then we can add a couple more instructions too. So we're exporting instructions in the instructions.js file. So we need to change the move lit r1 to move lit reg, and we need to remove the one for R2. Let's also add instructions for move register to register, move register to memory, and move memory to register. This is gonna, of course, mess up the CPU classes execute method. So let's fix that too. We still need to get this literal value from memory, so that's not gonna change, but we now need to get an encoded register index. We can easily do that with a modulus using the number of registers we have. That will ensure that we still get something sensible when we try and pull a register index that doesn't exist. And then we have to multiply the whole thing by two in order to account for the fact that registers can hold two bytes of value. Now we have an index, we need to set the literal value and return. Moving a register to a register is also quite simple. We need to first get the from register and the to register as indexes. We can do that the same way that we just grabbed the index above. And we can retrieve the value from the from register and then set that value in the to register. 
Likewise, moving a register's value to memory, we first need to get the index of the register and then fetch the 16-bit address where we want to set that value. The value can easily be extracted from the register and then set at the address in memory. And finally, we want the reverse operation where we can copy a value from memory into a register. First, we fetch the address just like before, then we get the index of the register and we read the value from memory and we write it into the register. Our CPU now has the power to interact with memory. Unfortunately, we don't have any way to peek inside the memory, so we can't see what's going on. So we should write another method for debugging and we'll call that view memory at. And we'll take an address parameter. So what I think would be nice is to be able to print out a small display of what's in memory around the address that we supply. And what we want to do in the end is to log out a string that looks something like this. So what we have is the address there on the left with a colon that indicates the start of where we're, where we're inspecting the memory. And then on the right, you see the byte that we find at that address plus the seven bytes that come after that. Now, a good thing to remember at this point is the CPU sometimes deals with values as bytes and it sometimes deals with them as 16-bit values, so two bytes joined together. Depending on the context, we might think of the address 0f01 having the byte value 04 or the 16-bit value 0405. Okay, so how can we do that? We can create an array of the eight bytes that occur from that address with array.from. For the mapping function, we can extract the index parameter that we're given and use that as an offset from the address. Then we can log that out all in this format that you've just seen now, all printed and padded nicely in hexadecimal. Let's use the new instructions as well as the memory viewer to see if everything is working. First of all, let's give ourselves a bit more memory to play around with. Now we can modify the adding program from last time using the new instructions. First, moving a value into the R1 register, and then another one into the R2 register. Then we can add them together just like before. Let's add one more instruction so that we can store the value back in main memory. That's gonna be a move register to memory. First specifying the register, which is the accumulator register, as that's where the results of calculations end up. For the address, let's use a value which is way beyond where our program ends, something like 0100. Lastly, we can add all the steps and the debugs that we need but also using the view memory at method. Let's, let's use that two times. Let's have one view memory at where we point to the instruction pointer and one view memory at where we point at the 0100 address so that we can see if it changes. So we can see that when we start, the instruction pointer is at zero as expected, and all of the other registers are also zeroed out. Now, if we read here at the program memory, which starts at zero, the instruction is a 0x10. And if we look that up in our instruction table, that's a move lit reg. That makes sense. We've just written that. So when we execute that, we see the value 1234 in the R1 register. So the new move instructions seem to be working correctly. The next instruction is another move literal to reg. And now we see the ABCD value in the R2 register. Our next instruction after that is the add register to register, OX14. 
and in the accumulator we see the total there, OXBE01. But here's where it gets interesting, the next instruction is an OX12, and that's going to be move register to memory. So remember, we're moving the accumulator, which has the value OXB, OXBE01, and we're going to move that to the memory location 0100. When we run this, we see here the first byte at that memory address is a BE, and the second byte is a 01. Together, as a 16-bit value, that will be the value 0XBE01. Now that's pretty cool. It's quite powerful that we can move values between the CPU and memory, but programs that can just add things aren't that much better than a calculator because the program doesn't make any kind of decisions. For decisions, we're gonna need conditional jumps. The instruction table here shows that there are quite a few different kinds of conditional jumps, and there might be more in the future too, but we're only gonna focus on one today, jump if not equal which compares a literal value to the accumulator register and then jumps to the supplied address if the values are not equal. Let's create a constant for that in the instructions.js file and create its implementation in the execute method of the CPU class. First, the value that we want to compare is going to be specified. It's 16 bits, so we can use a fetch16 for that. Then the address, which is also 16 bits, so we can again call fetch16. And then after that, we're going to need to check the value against what's currently inside the accumulator value. If they're not equal, then we're going to set the instruction pointer to the address which was supplied. Finally, we can return. Quite simple. Let's put all of this together and write a little bit more of a complex program. Let's write one that counts to three. So let's try and translate this fictional assembly language program into some machine code that we can define here. So the word at the start there, the word start, that is just a label. It indicates an address in memory and referring to the label is referring to that address. So in this case, that address would be zero. On this first move instruction, I've used a hash symbol to indicate that it's a memory address. So this instruction is going to move the value which is found at the address 0100 into the R1 register. This second instruction is going to move the literal value 1 into the R2 register. Then we're going to add the two registers together. We're going to move the value that's inside the accumulator into the memory address 0100. And then we're going to call our jump not equal instruction. Our comparison value is going to be three. So if the value inside the accumulator is not three, we're going to jump to the address of start, which is zero, the beginning of the program. So let's translate this into our machine code representation in the same way as we did before. And we won't have to worry about this label because it's just going to be the value zero. So we'll just put zero in at those points. Before we go ahead and actually run this code, I think we're getting to the point where it's starting to be worth it to write a mechanism to step through the code in a clean way, sort of instruction by instruction. This way we don't have to count how many times we would have to step and debug and view memory. We can use Node's built-in read line module for this. It allows you to read one line of input at a time and respond to it as an event. It's pretty straightforward to set up, we first need to create an interface which is connected to the standard in and standard out of the terminal. Then we can attach a line event to the interface we've just created. We're not going to do anything with the line. We don't care about what the, what the user pressed aside from enter. We're just going to step the CPU forward one cycle. We're going to call debug. 
and we're going to call view memory app with our two points. And we can put this on the outside too, so that we can see the first initial state before we run. So let's run it. Okay, so as expected, all of the registers start in the zero state and our first instruction is a 13 instruction, a move memory to register. Now we can see the value that's in OX100 here, it's zero. So nothing is gonna happen here. We're not gonna see the R1 register change. The next instruction is gonna be moving a literal value into a register. We're gonna move the value one into the register. So we should see that in R2 and we do. Now we have our add. So the accumulator adds one and zero, which we get one. And now we're gonna move that value one into the memory address 0100. And so now we actually see that there inside the memory. And finally, we encounter a 15, a jump not equal. So we're gonna compare with the value three and the accumulator is not three. So what we should see is the instruction pointer gets set back to zero. Great, so it's looping through. So let's run this through a little bit faster now. Go through the same procedure again. We have two in the accumulator, but we jump back again. And now we have three. When we finally go to execute the jump not equal, what we see is the instruction pointer just keeps increasing, but we're executing zeros. So we just treat them as no operation and we just keep moving through. So now we have a single way of making decisions. It's not what I would call convenient, but seeing as we can only use this as an extremely glorified calculator right now, it doesn't give us a whole lot of power. We're gonna extend the capabilities of this virtual machine in the next episode. Now, before this episode comes to an end, I want to share some news with you. I've started a Patreon for this channel. Making these videos is quite time consuming. Uh, it takes a lot of time in planning and editing and all of those kind of things. So if you're finding this kind of content interesting and you're in a position to do so, consider supporting the channel for as little as $1 per episode. You'll find all the relevant links for that down in the description. And if you're not in a position to do that, then please absolutely don't worry. Just watching is support enough and I super appreciate all of you who are. I really hope you've enjoyed this installment of building a virtual machine. Thanks very much for watching and I'll see you next time.